Hello, and welcome to uh, the first lecture for the second exam in ecology this semester. Uh, I'm recording this late in the schedule and late at night. It's almost midnight. <laughs> so, buckle in, although you may not be watching this at midnight. Anyway, my outfit today, I'm wearing another one of my beach bee-themed outfits. This is one of my favorite bee-themed outfits because it's just like not some generic bee. It actually looks like a bumblebee. And it actually even kind of looks like Bombus pennsylvanicus, uh, which is named after the state of Pennsylvania. So let's get into it. Let's talk about populations. Okay, let's talk about populations. So before we talk about how to study population ecology, we need to define what a population is and some of the properties that you can study and measure in a population to understand um, the ecology of a species. This is an adorable population of penguins here. So let's define a little bit about what a population is. Um, a population is a group of individuals of the same species that inhabit a given area. So you'll likely see more questions on future exams of identifying the hierarchical level of ecology that a study is covering. If it's of a single species and it's measuring multiple individuals um, of that species in a geographic range, that is a population level ecology study. Um, there are some four rules that govern what a population is. I've left these blanks so that you can fill them in while you're watching. Rule number one, um, members can interbreed. All members of a population um, can interbreed with each other. Uh, you know, obviously if it's male and female, they can't interbreed, but members of a population can interbreed. So they're a single genetic unit. A population is a single genetic unit. Number two, um, the, a population um, is essentially the same thing as a gene pool, and a gene pool is going to be the focus of evolution. And so population is a really important level at which to conduct studies of evolution. Uh, number three, um, a population is a spatial concept. It at least exists in two dimensions. Um, and it has a spatial boundary. So this image that you see here of human populations have um, a spatial concept of the United States, at least for this image, and a spatial boundary. Obviously, if you're measuring a human population, country boundaries don't really matter, but this is an example of a population. Um, in rule number four, they have structure and they are dynamic. We'll talk a little bit later um, in later lectures about the dynamics of a population. Um, and in this lecture, we'll talk a little bit about how they're structured. So sometimes measuring a population can be a little trickier than just measuring a single, uh, a measuring all of these single individuals within a population. Um, you can have unitary species or you can have modular species. Unitary species, um, in unitary species, their form, development, growth, and longevity are predictable and determinate from conception on. So humans, elephants, most verte all vertebrates, a lot of species are unitary in that one single individual person represents um, a single unit within that population, a single individual. You can also, though, have modular um, species. And these, this is when a zygote develops into a unit of construction which produces further similar modules, usually genetically identical. Um, one example is um, 
this coral, and other things that form, uh, that reproduce via asexual budding. If reproduction is happening asexually, that offspring is genetically identical, and so in terms of measuring the gene pool in a population, that counts as a single individual. And so that's modular species. This is a colonial coral. Um, there are also colonial hydroids and other, there are a lot of marine species that can be colonial. Um, coral is a really great example. Um, bees actually kind of complicate um, studies of populations um, because most of the individuals in a colony are not reproducing. Um, and because they're not reproducing and contributing to the next generation, um, they kind of don't count as single individuals. Um, if you've ever heard the term superorganism, it can be used to refer to a bee colony that's basically functioning as a single organism. And that's not really, this, the superorganism concept doesn't really apply so much when we're thinking about populations. But really, the, when you're thinking about like pop, individuals that are going to reproduce within a population, the only individuals in a bee colony, bumblebee colony specifically, that you're talking about are the queens that are going to be produced at the end of the season. All of these workers, for the most part, maybe some of them, maybe some of them will produce males, which are unfertilized eggs. But for the most part, they're they can't they are they're sterile, um, and they're not going to produce offspring into the next generation. So they don't really count when you're trying to measure population size in ecology. Um, Along those same lines of modularity, um, you can also have genets and ramets. Um, a genet is a plant uh, produced from sexual reproduction, and a ramet is a module that's produced asexually from a genet. So um, strawberries produced via stolons, you probably remember, maybe you remember this from GenBio. Each of these individuals, um, the parent here, parent here, parent here, parent here um, is the genet, and then all of these clones that are genetically identical that come off of this, those are the ramets. Uh, I think Janae was the only one who came on the nature walks on this weekend, but there's a stand of pawpaw that's right next to Winnie Palmer that has one large parent, and then right behind it you can see lots of clones of the pawpaw right behind it. Those are genetically identical to the parent um, and actually can't even, if they, they both produced flowers and the parent, they can't mate with each other because they're genetically identical. Um, populations are also distributed in space and so when you're doing an, e an ecological study of a population, you can measure this population distribution. Um, the geographic range of a population is defined as um, the area that encompasses all individuals of a species. Um, I did a population genetic study of a bumblebee species for my PhD dissertation, and these little pink dots e represent each of the sampling localities at which I collected those bumblebees. Um, the red triangles are a different species, so this is Bombus aphipiatus that I studied for my dissertation are the pink dots, the red triangles are another species, so this is the geographic range of Bombus wilmati. The pink dots, this is the geographic range of Bombus aphipiatus. Um, the term ubiquitous, when we're talking about population distributions, means that something has a widespread distribution. So Bombus aphipiatus is ubiquitous throughout Mexico and Central America. It has a widespread distribution. Um, when we're, the term endemic, on the other hand, is a distribution that's restricted to a particular locality or localized habitat. So Bombus wamadi you might consider as endemic because it really only occurs in southern Mexico and Chiapas and in um, this area here in Guatemala. So you might consider Bombus wamadi as endemic and Bombus aphipiatus 
as ubiquitous. These are important terms when you're trying to define um, a population distributions. Um, and then when, when we're thinking about organisms with wide distributions, um, their habitat can be described depending on the context of scale being considered. So a Phippiatus can be found across wide geographic range, but within that geographic range, it actually inhabits some ecologically distinct regions within it. So um, each of these colored regions here represents um, a different uh, mountain range in Mexico and in Central America. Uh, so this is the Sierra Madre Occidental Oriental. These are all mountain ranges. Uh, that's what Sierra means, is mountain. The Trans-Mexican Volcanic Belt is here. The Sierra Madre del Sur is here. These are higher elevation areas that Ephippiatus lives in. Um, and each of them has their own geologic history and uh, distinct ecology. Uh, so these are what are termed as ecoregions. We'll talk about ecoregions later on. Um, Here's some other highland areas that are just have a distinct ecology. And so um, there ha this habitat for Phippiatus can be described, you know, on a larger scale of across all of Mexico and Central America, but you can also describe it at an eco-region scale across this area. Um, you can also have subpopulations and metapopulations, uh, which are just um, smaller distinct units within a population, um, and we will likely talk about these later on. Um, another really cool example of a um, endemic population that is talked about in your textbook is the shale barren evening primrose, which lives only in the Allegheny Mountains, and we're like right there. Um, the Laurel Highlands are just adjacent to the Allegheny mountain range, which is very small, and the evening primrose is specifically adapted to um, shale formations, growing in shale rock formations uh, in the Allegheny Mountains. And so this has an endemic distribution, this, this species of primrose here. I've never seen it, but we should go hunt for it whenever the world's safe enough to go on field trips again. Um, so that's population distribution. Let's talk about population abundance um, and studying the number of individuals that occur within a certain geographic space that a population occupies. This is a look at population density, um, which is kind of the num also sort of related to abundance um, of human distributions throughout uh well, mostly this is only counting um, colonial peoples because it's not counting the indigenous populations out here uh, in the 1800s, but it's a look at an increase in population abundance um, in the United States over time. Um, so population density is the number of individuals per unit area. That's what's being measured here. Um, the distribution of individuals within a space can be uniform or clumped or random. Um, here are just some examples of species that have each of these different population distributions. Um, in clumped, um, this is the most common. Um, this likely occurs because of patchy habitat or resources maybe because some an organism is social um maybe because of asexual plant reproduction so when we talked about those stolons before that might cause a clumped plant distribution elephants are clumped because they are social and they gather in herds um and then a uniform distribution um can be formed from negative interactions among individuals of the same species so Maybe there is competition, heavily, heavy intraspecific competition. So this is an example of a creosote bush. Um, creosote might be uniformly distribu distributed because of uh, re limited resource availability. And so they are evenly distributed because they kind of have this like zone of territoriality of resource availability around them. Um, 
wolves are another example of a species that might have a more uniform distribution because of territoriality or intraspecific competition within a single species. And then there's random dandelions. Anything that's uh, their seeds are dispersed by wind uh, tends to have a random distribution. Um, so, um, yeah, dandelions are a great example of a plant that seeds are distributed randomly by wind. Um, so on the test, uh, be able to list some reasons why um, populations might be distributed this way. Um, and then ecological density in comparison to population density is the number of individuals per unit of available living space. Um, but this, even though this is a more realistic measure of density, uh, it's, it's very hard to quantify and so it's very rarely measured. Now let's talk about um, how to sample populations in the wild to do a study of ecology. Um, population size is the uh, density of individuals per um, the area, multiplied by the area that they occupy. Um, one frequently used tool for sampling populations that you are already very familiar with are quadrats. Um, because it is impossible f to measure the entire population of most species unless they are super endangered, um, quadrats and taking um, samples of the samples of the population and then using those samples to estimate the actual population size is how most ecologists do it. And so that's what we've been doing out at Winnie Palmer for the last two weeks is using quadrats, these standardized, um, units um, to measure how many individuals occur within that area. So if within your, a single quadrat that you measure, if there are a lot of individuals of one species in there, and then you do another one, and there are a lot in there, and then a lot in the third replicate, then you might, then you could estimate that the population size was very large. Another method that is commonly used mostly in birds is mark recapture. Um, here are some of the equations and the units that are used to calculate population size from mark recapture. So what you do is you catch a certain number of individuals and you mark them so that if you catch them again, you already know that you caught them. Um, so M is the number of marked individuals. So you'll mostly that's determined by, well, depending on the species, it might be determined by how many meat you can actually find. Um, if the population is really large, maybe it's a set number that you only collect. This little dude, if you've ever been bird banding, it's um, sometimes used as a mark recapture method, but also to um, measure survivability in birds. This little dude has a little band that's put on his leg, so if he's caught again, uh, they'll know uh, that he's already, that that's a recapture event and not an original event. Um, this is from when I did... I've only done bird banding twice in my life, and this is from when I did it. This is a picture of me from nine years ago uh, in Costa Rica when I was there on a conservation genetics course. And I woke up at the butt crack of dawn and went to a coffee plantation to help a fellow graduate student um, band birds in this coffee plantation. That person also was collecting poop from the birds and then doing DNA testing on their poop to see what bugs um, they were eating in the coffee plantations to see if they might help control pests by eating them. It was a really cool project. I am not an early morning person, given that I just told you that I was recording this video at midnight, so burned banding's not. Uh, I have only done it a few times because I don't like waking up in the morning. Anyway, um, oh, another really cool thing that's happening very close by, if you were in Monday's lab, you actually met the director of Powder Mill Nature Reserve at Winnie Palmer, um, just by chance. His name is Dr. John Wenzel. Uh, he's also an entomologist. He runs Powder Mill Nature Reserve, and they have a long history of bird banding at their avian research center there. We were going to go there this semester for a field trip, but then COVID happened, so maybe someday we'll be able to go back. Anyway, so you're doing a mark recapture study. M is the number of marked individuals that you catch the first time. 
n, little n, is the number of individuals that are captured during a second sampling. So this is round number one, and this is round number two. R is the number of individuals that are recaptured from M. So N is the number of total capture, new captures and recaptures, and R is the subset of those that were recaptured. Now N, that's what we don't know, and so what you're going to try to do, use these numbers, is to solve for N. So let's say um, you do a study where you catch uh, 20 birds of a single species. Uh, during the second round, you catch another 20, and only one of them, only one of those recaptured, one of those second round birds has a tag on it from when you did the marking the first time. Let's now solve for the population size. So, n times m, that's 20 times 20 is 400, divided by 1, that's 400 individuals in the population. Now let's change that equation a little bit and say that uh, you catch, you mark 20, you catch another 20, and all 20 individuals have bands on them. They're all the same ones you marked the first time. That's 20 times 20, 400 over 20 is 20. So what you see from that is that the lower the number of recaptured individuals during a second sampling, the larger the population. So the larger the population, the less likely you are to catch the same individuals the second time. So the larger the R, the smaller the population. The lower the R, the smaller the, sorry. The lower the R, the larger the population. If you have a large R and you are very frequently re-catching individuals, then you have a smaller population size. Oh, and you have to, if you're doing any kind of study, um, when you're doing your sampling units, you have to take into account the dispersion um, of the individuals in the population and account for that in your sampling method. So it isn't, if you don't do that properly, let's say you're studying a species and you didn't do your research, and you went out and you randomly sampled here and here and here and you, you all of a sudden you concluded that that species is extinct from the area because you didn't understand its basic biology and that it lives in a clump distribution. So it's really important to understand the uh, distribution of your species before you sample it. Now let's talk about population age structures. Uh, these you should be familiar with from GenBio. Um, this is the age structure of male and female individuals in the United States over time. Um, you can see that the bars are slowly growing as the human population size increases. Um, the number of individuals at younger ages is growing a lot. Um, and an age structure graph like this can tell you a lot about what might happen to a population in the future. So if you have in an age structure graph a lot of individuals that are pre-reproductive, so they uh, have not reached sexual maturity, you might predict that in the future you might see a population size increase as those individuals reach reproductive age and contribute to the next generation. On the other hand, if you see um, a more even distribution with smaller numbers of pre-reproductive -re individuals compared to post-reproductive, you might predict that there might be a population decrease in the future um, because you have a smaller number of pre-reproductive individuals then reaching sexual maturity in the future and contributing to the next generation. So the shape of this graph can help you make predictions about population growth in the future. Another thing that can be really insightful for understanding in populations are sex ratios, so the number of males to females. Um, this is a really cool study that was done um, of sex ratio variation in different populations of uh, Gambusia, the mosquito fish. Um, 
this is the female, this is the male, and they were looking at sex ratio distributions of this fish across its geographic range. Um, what they found is that the female bias population, so things like this, this one, a lot of them over here in the U.S., um, these female bias populations induced stronger trophic cascades compared with male bias populations, which caused, caused larger changes to um, key community and ecosystem responses. So having more females caused a stronger trophic cascade, um, which hopefully you'll remember from Gen Bio. Um, so that's um, cascading effects from one species eating another species and one spe that species eating another species. That's what a trophic cascade is. Having more females caused a stronger trophic cascade, so more there was more influence of this population on individual on species that it fed on or fed on it. Um, so it's causing larger changes in key community and ecosystem responses. So they're having more females affect zooplankton abundance that they feed on affected phytoplankton abundance because the zooplankton might feed on the phytoplankton it affected the productivities in general of those areas that they live in as well as even ph and temperature just having a higher sex ratio um, because maybe these females are eating and consuming more in the environment than the males and you can imagine that if you had if females are consuming more, maybe outputting more waste, um, and you have a dramatically skewed sex ratio in a population, you might see how that might affect um, other species in that community. So really cool study looking at sex ratio variation. And then you can also study the individual movements within populations and how the movement of those individuals will change the population structure. Um, and we'll talk more about this in chapter nine. Uh, dispersal is the movement of individuals in space. So um, how far are they moving in geographic space? Uh, I can't remember which lecture we talked about this before, um, but one way that they have met, that people have measured dispersal capabilities of bees is by uh, kind of quote unquote kidnapping them where they live and then driving them out in a car and seeing if they can make it back home. Uh, larger bees can fly larger distances and s longer distances. And so they can, I think the longest range that's been recorded for an individual bumblebee making it back home is about 10 kilometers. So that's the dispersal ability of individuals in the population. Immigration is when individuals move out of a population. So um, that would be, this is, stuff for my uh, PhD dissertation again. Uh, that would be like an individual moving from this population into this one. Immigration is when individuals move from another location into a subpopulation. So um, you might consider this a subpopulation here that is immigration. Um, so immigration and immigration are all relative to um, the population that you're thinking about. So if an individual moves from this one into this one, it is emigrating out of this one and immigrating into this population. And then migration is round trip movement. Um, and individual movement can be dictated by the physiology of the species. So we just talked about bees um, and how far they can move. Here in Mexico, it's really hard for bees to disperse across this area and this area here, because this is a lowland region that's um, mostly desert and bees can't live there. And so this is an important geographic barrier to individual movement in bumblebee populations. This is called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. You won't have to know that. This other one down here is a very similar region. It's lowland, it's dry and it's hot. Uh, this is the Nicaraguan depression. Uh, and this is another barrier to movement in bumblebees. Um, Jewelweed is a great example of dispersal capabilities of an individual species. I tried to pop some of these seed pods on the nature walk the other day, um, but I don't think they were ready to go yet. Uh, so they didn't pop out, but uh, 
This is seed pod has a great method for dispersing its offspring so that it can grow its um, population in geographic space. And some plants and animal some plants require um, seed dispersers. So this is a mistletoe bird. Um, I think it's wiping its butt in this picture. Um, mistletoe seed, mistletoe is a parasitic plant. I think I'm going to talk about these again later on. Mistletoe is a parasitic plant that requires birds to eat its seeds to move. Um, so birds come, they eat the seeds, um, but the seeds are really, really sticky and they stick to the bird's butt. And so uh, that is an evolutionary adaptation because they are parasitic. They need to land on a tree for them to parasitize. They're hemiparasitic. Um, and so by making them sticky in the poop of birds, the bird has to wipe its butt on a tree branch to get the seeds off. And so by making the bird's poop sticky, it's making the bird place its seeds specifically onto um, a tree branch where it can parasitize the tree branch. So that's just one of my favorite examples of dispersal capabilities. Okay, so that's it. Kind of a short one for chapter eight. Chapter nine coming soon. Bye-bye.